Hey, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And today we have two authors joining us, Connie Berry, her brand new book, The Art of Betrayal. And we just got a nice little stash of uh, autographed copies. So I'll go ahead and put in the comments field the link if you'd like to buy one. Um, and then also joining us is Jane Cleland, who's going to be doing the heavy lifting on the interview. Uh, and we still have a copy of, this is your most recent book, right? This is from last Correct. December. And she just told us that she has a new one coming out this December. So I'm, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. But as, as always, I'll be monitoring the comments. So if you have questions for, uh, for Connie or Jane uh, or Barbara, go ahead and put them in the comments field and I'll emerge. I'll be summoned from the darkness uh, towards the end of the program to ask any of your questions. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. What a pleasure it is to see you, Jane. And Connie, it's delightful to see you as well. So this is your third book um, yeah. about Kate Hamilton, um, who is analogous in many ways to Jane's lead character, uh, antiques being a focal point of the mysteries. But yours, Connie, is set in England, although you reference Kate's business in Ohio, whereas Jane is in New Hampshire, but creeping globally. So she could talk to us about that. I think if I remember in Hidden Treasure, aren't they heading for Washington? There's a tease. There's they, a tease. Yeah, they're, they're not going. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, spoil that. But in any case, um, it's amazing that the, you know, the incredible um, reach that a shop in New Hampshire can have. And you know what, Jane? You're a real pioneer because in this global age where people were Zooming, it's turning out that people with local craft businesses or you know antique businesses or whatever have suddenly become international sellers. So oh, what, my editor, what my editor tells me, Barbara, and the reason they're not going, and I, I sort of don't mind giving this away, is that my readers actually value Rocky Point. Mm -hmm. as much as Josie, as much as the antiques. And the ensemble cast is there, the locations are there, and they're familiar now. Hidden Treasure was book number 13. Jane Austen's Lost Letters coming out is number 14 next December. And they wanna be part of that community. And Connie, you have created a wonderful community in England. Tell us about the community. Um, well, the community is called Long Barston. It is a fictional village in Suffolk, quite near to the Essex border, not unlike Long Melford. Uh, it well, is, for people who aren't familiar with England, give us some orientation Suffolk, to, to Suffolk London. Suffolk is um, a very rural county. It's not on the tourist maps, which actually I love. It is uh, northeast of London, but not too far. It only takes maybe an hour, an hour and a half to get to London. It is uh, east of Cambridge. So that kind of gives you an idea. Um, it, it, Essex is just south of it and Norfolk is just north of it. And those three counties are called East Anglia. And that was the center of the old Anglo-Saxon culture. And so it is a really historical era area. It is, um, Suffolk is actually quite flat. There's a lot of farming there. So it has big skies and, and kind of rolling hills, a lot of hedgerows, little tiny villages, little tiny roads that go nowhere. You, you don't get anywhere really fast in, in Suffolk. So there isn't is, a big M1 going through it. Is, um, is it the kind of place where Londoners go for their summer house or their weekend house? Um, it's not as popular, it wouldn't be as popular as, for example, the Cotswolds. <laughs> um, a lot of wealthy people go there. There are people who go to Suffolk, but it doesn't have that same kind of elan that, that uh, other places in England does. It, it's kind of out of the way. It's not ultra fashionable, except that now a lot of um, British celebrities are starting to discover Suffolk. And so if you look online and say discover Suffolk, you'll find articles by different personalities um, in Britain who think, oh, this is just wonderful. And mainly it's because there are not a lot of, a lot of wealthy people there. It's, it's very rural, it's, it's uh, very unspoiled and very historic. 
let's go. <laughs> you know, it'll be like Santa Fe or Aspen or somewhere where, yeah. you know, yeah. they will go and they will completely ruin it. Actually, Jane, I was giving you a, a feeding you a reason why they can stay in Rocky Point and yet achieve wider goals, you know, because because of people getting used to online sales and all. You probably have already written your book and so it'll have to be the next book, but. <laughs> Yeah, maybe yeah. it's a very good point, though. Yeah, um, and it'll work for Connie, too. You know, that you could actually turn the antiques business that in this book she is babysitting, but, you know, may well have a larger role in. Um, both of them can actually become a much larger business and more international now that the world is adjusted to, you know, internet sales. No, I think that's really a, a very good point. And I, I actually think that we don't know yet the fallout. I don't know where it's going to end up you have had an international business barbara forever yep um, we have actually since 1990 <laughs> so yeah, yeah. You know, so COVID hasn't been any different for us at all um, in any respect except that um instead of putting the video uh on facebook live from the bookstore when you were sitting there in the store with me we're doing it this way. But on yeah. the other hand, I, it's not clear that you and Connie and I could all have assembled in Scottsdale on any particular evening to have had a discussion. So, you know, there are some wonderful advantages to, to the ability to bring people together um, from different locations um, and have a conversation that we didn't have before. I think sure. that's 100% true. And Connie, back to you, why Suffolk? Um, well, my husband and I have done a lot of traveling in, uh, in England. I, I, I'm a complete and utter Anglophile, always have been. I went to school uh, during college, partly there, St. Clair's College, Oxford, and I really kind of fell under the spell of the British Isles. And so as we travel, we tried to go to different areas. And as soon as I saw Suffolk and stayed there, I just felt kind of at home. I, I love history. I, I love history passionately. And there is so much ancient history there from the Vikings to the Anglo-Saxons to the early Normans. And um, so I, I just kind of fell in love with it. And then I thought, you know, it's not an area that people visit a lot. It's not an area that's been written about, although it is becoming more popular, as I said, people, actually some television series have started to set some of their episodes in Suffolk. And how does that there's inform a wonderful your plot? Costume. I'm sorry? How does that inform your plot? How does the history, Suffolk um, in particular, but how, uh, I was really struck and loved the, the way you wove in history in your, in your books. In, in the Art of Betrayal, uh, one of the storylines involves um, a legend about a green maiden. Now, I, um, I have to confess that I made that up, but um, it, it's not totally made up because there are legends in that area. There, there's a legend of uh, a young boy and a girl, the, the green children of Woolpit, which is part um, right, right in East Anglia. And there are always legends of the green man and so all of this came out of Anglo-Saxon history, pre-Norman history. And um, one of the interesting things, I don't know if either of you have, have heard of the Doomsday Book, but when um, William the Conqueror came over, soon after that, he ordered a census to be taken of all of his new land. And it was people and land and animals and, and um, you know, all kinds of things. And so census takers went out and did it. And for all the other counties of England, they summarized it. So it's very brief and summarized, but for some reason, the, the reports from Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex, Essex never got summarized. So they're just what the census takers wrote down. And there's all of these, little tiny historical details, even the musings of the census takers, what they thought about what they saw, and so many names. And, and so the um, that part of the Doomsday Book is actually much larger because it's undigested. And, and many of those stories made it into legend. And those legends are still celebrated in East Anglia. And um, that kind of formed the backdrop of this, this this history and legend 
And so things actually happen at the Mayfair, which is a, a great tradition in England, Mayfairs. And at the Mayfair, they're putting on a pageant of the Green Maiden, and that's where all the murder and mayhem begins. <laughs> and there's some Chinese influence. Yes, that, that's true. Um, you know, that a lot of that comes from my parents because my parents were high-end antiques dealers. And so um, there is a particular carved cinnabar plate that Lady Barbara Finchley Ford, who was the local lady of the manor in Long Barston, owns and she would like to sell it to get rid of, to get rid of it because she's embarrassed because it came from the sacking of the old summer palace in Beijing in 1860. And one of her relatives actually stole it. So she's very ashamed of this and she wants to get rid of it. She would like to have the money, needs the money, but that also plays a big part in the book. So British history um, is multi-layered, obviously. All, yes, all history indeed. Is, but and you just raised fun. something, you just raised an issue that is, I think, really interesting about statute of limitations. I have to deal with that sometimes in my stories with theft, where we think of it as six, seven years in this country. There are other countries where, you know, two years, if you didn't know it was stolen, it's yours. And yeah. that's kind of outrageous when you think about it. Yeah, well, that that was just the way things were back then. You know, with, well, I'm with talking and marbles and- no, and, I'm talking now. Yeah, now. Oh, now? Now. Oh, you mean you mean something stolen and in two years it's yours? Japan. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I, I know. didn't know that. Well, yeah. uh, I'll tell you what. China does not feel that way. <laughs> and this this sacking of of the Summer Palace. Most people don't realize this, but that was such a humiliation for China. And this happened in 1860. They've never gotten over it. Yeah, And so um, it is a deep humiliation for them and they just put it in their constitution that the repatriation of the items stolen from their history is now a mandate. Mm. And so um, actually there are a series of thefts in museums and art galleries of these items and they can't prove who did it, but, but the, the international art people are, are pretty sure it's Chinese people who are really stealing back what they consider to oh, be their that's, that's interesting because in Britain, for example, uh, their laws specify that nothing can be de... I, I wanted to use the word commissioned, but that's no, not No, it's right. de-accessioned. De-accessioned yeah. from a museum. Yeah. And so they if they want it back, they're going to have to steal it. This is like terrible. Or, or buy it. The the other thing they're doing well, the is museums won't sell it. They well, it cannot be but, taken out of a museum. Yeah, right. But but in auctions, there are privately owned items that go to auction, and very wealthy Chinese people um, through proxies often come in and purchase these things and then take them home and put them yeah. in museums. Yeah. Mm. I also thought this is a whole change of subject. I also thought your book was awfully romantic. So talk to me about weaving romance into mystery. Yeah, I, you know, it is kind of a mashup and I actually didn't mean it to be that way. I didn't set out for, for it to be a, a mashup of romance, but it's just her life. And so um, she is a young widow. I consider her young. She's 45 or 46, depending on when her birthday is. And she has two college age children, but she is, you know, interested in men and this very handsome, charming detective inspector from England shows up initially in Scotland where she met him. And it, you know, it, it's just her life. So she is living her life. And this is a part of her life. So there's a, a greater story arc that is going on. Uh -huh. and, you know, so I, I didn't actually intend that, Jane, but it just kind of turned out that way. It's been very fun to write. Well, it's charming. I, you know, it's, 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 not, um, it's not a simple relationship. And I, I appreciated that very much. One of the, another edict my editor gave me was that Josie has to be very careful 
not to let the men in her life solve the crime or solve any part of the crime. It has to be all her. And therefore her now husband, Ty, when they first met and everything, every book I had to get him out of town for some reason, because, you know, he was just too involved. Yeah. I, I sent him to, he had an, an aunt Trina in California. So off he went. And sometimes he's doing training because he's with Homeland Security now. So he's doing training somewhere. But are you going to, as the series develops, do you think that you are going to have to be careful not to let his detective expertise inhibit her from strutting her stuff? You know, I, I honestly think that I have done that and, and I have been aware of that. And in the first book, um, she is the one who's in danger. She is the one who solves the crime. He shows up but not in time or in a position to do anything to help her. Um, she has to do it herself. In, in the second book, um, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. In this third book, um, well, I shouldn't give it away, should I? No, I no. But let, me, <laughs> let me speak up and say that, you know, at the end of the day, she is a private citizen. She can't yeah. arrest anybody. And so I think she has to be a team um, in the same way that Josie can't arrest anybody either. So she has um, police, you know, part of the, she has a good relationship with the Rocky Point Police Department. So yeah, you, know, right. you can't, unless you're going to make her a cop, you know, you can't make her the only person who, who brings the whole yeah. thing to a conclusion. And, you know, that was true back in the women's sleuth area in the 1990s when there was this huge movement generated by Sarah Paresky and Marsha Muller and Sue Grafton and so forth, that what we would have is a whole series of women investigators. Most of them were private eyes. Um, and they would lead the, you know, the investigation and they would be the star of the book. But still, at the end of the day, they couldn't arrest anybody either. And so uh, it's not uncommon for there to be a personal relationship, either a boyfriend or a brother or, you know, Lord Peter, for example, his brother-in-law is the cop. <laughs> You know, yeah. which which works out. Even Lord Peter couldn't actually arrest anybody. And, you know. and, and Hercule Poirot and Inspector Jap. Exactly. Thing. And so, you know, anytime you have an amateur sleuth, you also have to have a professional law enforcement person connected with that. And I think particularly with Tom, you know, he's always going to have to be um, a major part. I mean, he may not be the person who gets to the solution first, but he is the person who's going to clean it up afterward yeah one, one of the one of the most common comments that, that i've had which i really like is people say i like the fact that he respects her skills yeah and um he he sees that she has certain abilities her, her abilities are um the ability to to notice details and to make connections and that's something that police don't normally do. They, they make connections, but it's based on evidence. And so you can't investigate a crime because you have a suspicion that something's going on. You have to have evidence to do it. So he's right. kind of hampered in a sense by his official status where she isn't. And she also can use her expertise like, like Josie does. And, and by the way, Jane, I am right now reading uh, Deadly Threads. So I'm catching up to the newest one. Excellent. Yeah, that one is about vintage clothing. Yes, I love that. Thank you. Um, how do you pick the antique that's going to be the pivotal antique? I, um, I don't know. That, that's a good question. But I, um, I grew up with antiques. And I've never been... In an antique dealer, I think you have, Jane, or maybe still are, I don't know, but- no, um, Rare books, I, I dealt in rare oh, books. Oh, okay, oh. okay. But my, my parents are antique dealers, and so I grew up with them, and things would come into our house, and kind of bizarre things, like we had for about a year, we had a life-size marble bust of Marie Antoinette just sitting in our living room waiting for someone to buy it or something, and and then we, we had a- uh, do you, do you know what a nodder is? A nodder? A, a nodder is a, a porcelain figure, oriental, usually a Buddha, but not always. 
and it's articulated. So it had its head is articulated in the hands and the tongue. And so when you set it going, it's going like this and its tongue is coming out. And so to me, it was just like perfectly normal. I learned later as an adult that all my friends thought it was so creepy. They just thought our house was so odd and so weird. But it, it just objects that I remember, things that my parents were excited about, things that I saw. And um, I, I guess that's kind of how, how I pick them. And is, some, is, some of the, the objects, I actually have them. Does the antique come first in your plotting, in your story development? Um, in, yes and no. Um, the, in this uh, art, art of betrayal, um, I think that I um, thought about the antiques later, but, but in the first and second books, I think I, I actually was building them on an antique. So I, I'm actually trying to remember. I've, I'm in edits now for my fourth book. And so if I actually remember my first three books, I'm gonna be doing well. <laughs> What's the fourth book's title? The fourth book is uh, entitled The Shadow of Memory, and it will be released in June of 2022. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Talk a little bit about your writing process. Yeah. I, um, first of all, I, my, my, my favorite quote, and it's usually attributed to Dorothy Parker, but I don't actually think she said it was, I hate writing. I love having written. And that really is me. So my first draft, getting things down on the blank paper is just such hard work. I, I don't know. I, you know, I'd love to ask you about that too, because it's so hard, but once I have words on a page, any kind of words, however terrible they are, I love that. Then I can work with them. And, and I think that's where actually the book is written, um, shaping and polishing and smoothing out and layering back in. And um, that's what I love. So um, I usually start about mid-morning, I mean, just in terms of a daily thing, start about mid-morning. I probably put in usually four or five hours a day. And then around four, something like that, I, I take off, but I go back and check on things every once in a while. Even right before I go to bed, I do that. I heard Hank say that one time, Hank Philippi Ryan. She said she goes and says goodbye to the book or good night to the book. And, and I do that too. Before I turn off my computer, I just kind of read, but I start every day by revising what I've written the day before. And that is good for me because it's a way to get back into the book, to remind myself of what I was doing and to kind of get in the groove. And then with that, I can kind of push forward. How long overall does it take you soup to nuts to write a book? Nine months is what I've always said. Um, I, I had to actually ask for an extension on this latest book. And I think it was because of COVID. I, you know, before COVID hit, I said to my, right before COVID hit, I said to my husband, oh, I wish the world would just stop. Everything would just stop and I could just write. Well, the world stopped, but I couldn't really focus. I had such a hard time focusing, especially during those first months. And so I kind of lost some time. Fortunately, my publisher gave me that extra time. So this one's taken a full year. But by the way, just as an aside, nine months or a year, that's quick. Is it really? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I, when, you're, when you're writing one a year, when you're doing yeah. a series and that's the expectation, you get on that escalator and that's the way that goes. Yeah. But give yourself a little pat on the back and... Uh, happy face because how, do, how about you jane how, how long does it take you it takes me longer to write the synopsis than it does to write the book i find synopses just you know kill me now um it takes me six to eight months to write a synopsis and then once i have it i can write the book in four five six months 
but I've never written a synopsis. So how I've are you never... selling subsequent books? That I don't know. You could ask Crooked Lane. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so they I, just say we want a fourth and that's it? They they just said, well, you know, we you can well, I've gotten two two book contracts. Now I'm finished with that. So I don't know what is coming ahead. We'll see. But I've always um, had to write a synopsis so that that would um, be helpful. Well, it, it's painful, but it is, it, it can be helpful. I, I find the, the opening of the book, the, getting the start is the hardest for me. It takes me a long time to figure out where a book begins. And I know it is easy to say in the middle of the inciting incident, but I have trouble figuring out what the inciting incident is. Is it the first mention of the trouble or is it that much later than that the incident that actually catapults people into the nightmare that is going to be resolved. I have trouble with that. But once I get the first 50 pages or so down, then I can just, then I go on a tear. But you said something else I want to come back to that I think is interesting. I also prefer revision to writing new material. And um, I think there are two kinds of authors in the world, those that enjoy the original writing and dread the revision, and those that just want to get something down on paper, and then we can revise it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make I've, sense? Yeah, yeah I've, I've heard a lot of people say that, and I, you know, I believe them, but I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. That it must be a completely different kind of person, because for me, everything happens in revision. Yeah. And actually, honestly, until I have gotten to the end of the book, I don't actually know what the book is about. Once I get to the end of that draft, which really isn't a first draft because I've done so much revision already, right. but once I get to the completion of the story, then I feel like I understand the story and then I can go back and with that knowledge, I see the beginning with a whole different eye. And um, it, it is so helpful. So I, you know, that's just the way I write. Well, are you saying that you don't know who the killer is until the end? No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, because I, uh, in the book I just finished, I, I wasn't actually sure. I had several possibilities, but, in the other books, I always knew the story, but it, it I mean, it, it isn't the plot so much that I don't know. It's what the book is about. It's the, the underlying themes and, mm -hmm. and how things are to develop and characters even. And yeah. is that character consistent with the person that he ends up or she ends up to be? And so, Every time I finish, I, I feel like, okay, now I get the book. That makes a lot of sense to me. I actually, um, as I've gotten more into the series and have become a more experienced writer, I am paying way more attention to theme. And I'm actually thinking more about theme than plot before I begin. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing, but that's what I'm doing. I think it's a good thing, Jane. Let me go back while we're talking about process. Can, um, I have a very interesting discussion running on our homepage with JT Ellison and um, I'm going blank here. Oh, um, and um, Jane Ann Krentz about the Gothic novel, because I think that the Gothic has made a strong comeback. And you're, you've actually written a Gothic novel, Connie, whether you know it or not. Um, it has it has all those classic elements of a gothic and you know think about Rebecca you know um, Manderley is the framework you have this big house in this book yeah. that has mysterious things in it and a potentially absent um, we don't know exactly what's going on with the people who live in it and no spoilers here and at some point or other the Gothic really takes over at the end. The way the house is situated, the landscape of the house, the river that runs by it, the whole bit, you know. So it's a, it's a classic example of a modern Gothic. And I don't know that you knew that when you wrote it or that you even realize it now. 
I, I, I had comments, especially about the first book, which took place in Scotland, right. that, that people saw um, gothic elements in it. But I, I should look that up, shouldn't I? I? I should figure out what that is because I didn't set out to write a gothic novel. But I think that must be just what I love. I, I love old things, old houses, history. I love hidden secrets. I love delving into history and having secrets be revealed and that changes things and changes well, and, people. And the other oh, element there, Connie, that Barbara alluded to is the atmosphere. Your books are very atmospheric um, in an, I, I don't wanna say scary so much as evocative, how you would feel if you were uh, walking through the woods at that moment or looking out the window and seeing that dark and scary view. Well, there's a certain Agatha Christie element in the Gothic, which is to say that, you know, it, it takes place in a relatively contained space. So it's that whole Agatha Christie country house. It's not a locked room murder. People get all these terms confused, but, you know, you, and it's a useful structure for a story because if you have an infinite number of suspects, you're never going to bring the investigation to a close. And Jane, you've had at least a couple of books which are have basic gothics in it. And that's when the place is almost more important than the antique, you know, the how or the you've got one in particular, I can't remember the title where, you know, the estate, the house is a really big part of the whole thing and what Thank goes you. on inside the house. And that is um, that again verges towards the Gothic. But the yeah. other thing I think that, that you should both talk about, because aside from all of this, these are businesses that your two protagonists are running. They are running an antique business. And in this book, Connie, you know, you bring up the whole question of insurance. You know, something, something disappears and it disappears while she and the gentleman whose um, business she's babysitting, so to speak, have it in their custody. And therefore, they're liable for it. And you know, there's a, a huge problem there for them. And Jane, you address the business aspects of running an antiques business brilliantly in every one of your books. You have to deal with insurance, you have to deal with providence, you have to deal with, you know, staffing, you have to deal with, you know, preparing a show, you have to do all this other stuff. And I think that's one reason your books are so interesting, is because you show us how these businesses work at the same time that everything else is going on. Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll answer first and then kick it over to you, Connie, that I think you're right. I, I, I love the business aspect and I love that Josie is doing so well and her business has succeeded. I've had, I, some of the reviews I've gotten have just really thrilled me that I created a workplace where everyone wants a job. It, it's supportive, it is um, encouraging, it is teamwork there's career paths, there's growth, and the business is doing well. In Dolled Up for Murder in particular, um, there was a very valuable antique and you hire a particular transport company that does what is called nail to nail uh, transport. They are insurance wise liable from the minute they take it off the wall, nail, until it gets hanged on whatever hung on whatever wall it's going to. Uh, so it's nail to nail. And I had a hard time researching that. I'm, I think I'm wrong. I think it's lethal treasure actually. Isn't that funny? You don't remember your own plots? <laughs> I get but it. But I actually, it would involve some very valuable jewelry and I got to go to a very valuable jewelry store, <laughs> private. At the corner of 58th and 5th, I had no idea this place existed. I got an entree and I got to go up and they like they nearly strip search you in order to get in. They let me put on one of Coco Chanel's bracelets and I have little wrists, but it barely went on and it almost did not come off, just saying. And diamond <laughs> rings, oh my. At one point I just fell in love with one and I didn't want to take it off. And the woman who was showing me stuff looked at me and said, um, just for your information, there are cameras circling the room and it would not be good for either one of us <laughs> if you tried to make a break for it without your 
I, oh, I never would. What are you saying? No, no, no. Here. And I gave it to her. Just, it was beautiful. Anyway, I learned a little bit about the high end jewelry business. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> my, so. my, my parents love jewelry. Um, they, they had a lot of jewelry and, um, yeah, they, they just loved it. Um, and so were they actually jewelers? Were they gemologists? No, no. And my, my dad always wanted me to become a gemologist, but, um, I, I had other plans. And so I, I, you know, I, I either could like take over their life or I could have my own life. And so I've had my own life and, and I had wonderful parents. And so before, when my dad was very elderly, he met a, a dealer from um, Florida. Oh, Palm Springs, what is it? Palm Springs, Florida. I, anyway, who Palm was Beach, probably Palm Beach, Florida. That's exactly right. And he was more of a fanatic than my father. <laughs> and my dad made a deal with him, which I didn't know until later. And the deal was that he would buy everything that I had, but he could set the price. Now I could say yes or no, but he set the price, but he wouldn't like turn down or pick through it. And so for years after my parents died, he would come through twice a year with a big caravan and his wife and they would come in and I would get boxes out of the basement. I didn't even know what was in them. And we would just unpack stuff and then he would make a list and he would give a price. And I think there are only a couple of times when I said no, um, because I, you know, I, I either had to give my life over to being an antique dealer like my parents, or I had to do this. So, and business wise, you, you mentioned business. Um, my parents were not good business people. And they, they really didn't have much insurance. So, but this was a long time ago. Um, and, you know, if they had ever been robbed, they, they, they just would have been out of a lot of money because it's so expensive yeah. to insure fine antiques. And that's a little bit what Ivor Tweedy, who has owned, who's owned this antiquities business, he has some insurance, but it's nowhere near enough to cover the cost. So he's put his money into security in the shop but he didn't doesn't realize that his security is not quite as good as he thought it was how do you handle the business aspect of kate's business when it sounds like you don't have a business experience you don't love that part how, how does that figure into things we we never actually see kate's business kate has a shop um it, and I've even forgotten the name of it now. I, I gave it a name, but it, she specializes in fine objects of the um, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And her it's business- in Ohio, it, right? It's in a fictional town called Jackson Falls, Ohio. And um, in the first couple of books, when she would go to England, her mother would come down and kind of run the shop. That ended, but she has a good friend, Charlotte, who is an ex window dresser at a high end store in Chicago. And she has worked for Kate for many years, they're best friends. And now Charlotte is the one who's coming and taking over and she's actually learning the business. And she is so good at merchandising and displaying things. And so the business is thriving under Charlotte's um, care. And so Kate really isn't that concerned about her business and, you know, really nothing about the business, how she gets her money. I mean, we never talk about that. Um, she's, she's okay. You know, she's fine. And she's more interested now in Ivor Tweedy's business. Well, she has to be if she's going to sustain this relationship. Yes, with the, exactly. You know, with a with a constabulary in Suffolk, she's going to, you know, a long distance. You can't really have a solid commuter relationship for for the long haul. It's just too difficult. And this yeah. is before Brexit and COVID and all the rest of it. So, you know, obviously, if she's going to continue her relationship with Tom, she's going to need to take over the elderly Ivor Tweedy shop which you know conveniently um is located there um and then maybe she can have a 
you know, US UK partnership with Charlotte or something, but you know, you've laid all the foundation for it very yeah. carefully. Um, yeah. And, and you know, very... Tom, Tom can't continue his career in Ohio, but she can continue to run an antiques business and her career in Suffolk. I mean, you know, it's one of those situations where there's no real compromise, you know. Well, in, in the uh, in the fourth book, uh, let's see, should I say this or not? No, I don't think I will. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Well, I'm not saying it's easy to work out. You yeah. know, it can be a lot yeah. of a lot of back and forth. And fortunately, they're both of an age where they don't have to really think about children at home and you know the kinds of things that can really weigh down an effort to to try to have a long distance romance they're both now um you know in their middle 40s and and so they can they can negotiate however it works out i think you've done a great job setting it up for the long haul in the same way that jane has been setting up you know uh, josie from from the very beginning and yes if i if i had to be employed which i'm not because you know i have a not-for-profit bookstore but were i to be employed, well i do it always has been but if i were to be employed i uh, I, you don't know that? No, I just do it. I do it for fun, right? My staff are serious about it. They actually get paid, but I do not. Um, I would love to work. I would love to work at Prescott's because I think I think you've done a great job. However, the key to it is that they have never been seriously stressed for money, and you can have a far more upbeat business if your cash flow, you know, is a positive one. And um, so that's a that's a big part of it. Um, and Josie, you know, Josie's been very good at finding new new outlets and so forth. Um, we sit around right now this year and ask ourselves if we a want to work this hard, and b if we tried to slow it down, what would the effect be on um, on the business? And the truth is, you can't really start to say no and not kill your business. So I, you know. I feel kind of guilty watching them all work so hard. It makes absolutely no financial difference to me whatsoever. But I do worry sometimes, you know, that that is running away with them and they don't really want to work that hard. But if we slowed it down, what would that do? You're listening to this, Patrick, right? Want to come in and join in because this is a question you and I have been discussing with the rest of the staff. It's it's a hundred percent true. And oh, yeah. I, I'm listening. <laughs> yeah, but but you gotta but, keep going or it ends. I think it I think that it's almost impossible to start chopping at it without killing it. You know, I just do. But you know, Patrick, you've raised the question and I agree with you. Do, do we really want to work this hard all the time? Um I'm no. not saying you should answer <laughs> it, but I mean it's it's a hard question. It is a hard question. It's it's kind of fine-tuning it and discovering what are the what are the things that are really worthwhile and what are the things that you know that you might that you could trim but uh, that's always hard because you know we all have a lot of things that we really love to do you know that keep that make the job really fun and enjoyable and keep us kind of sustained that don't make any money <laughs> you know especially me um, oh, no, it's sadly true, but I was thinking, Jane, you know, it could be an interesting book where you wrote one where Josie tries a new idea or an expansion and has to come to grips with the fact that it was a mistake. Yeah. You know, because not yeah. everything can be successful. We, we've had a couple of, you know, we were lucky we were rescued from our largest misstep, which was owning a second store because we didn't recognize that none of us really wanted to own a second store and commute and so forth. We were saved by the landlord who totally screwed up and we were able to get out of it. And from that, we learned. We learned a number of things about ourselves and what kind of a business we wanted to have. But it might be an interesting thing for Josie to go through. You know, she's had one success after another. Maybe she needs to try one that is not going to work. The, that's a very that that's a very intriguing idea, Barbara, and how it how it would affect the staff. Well, and it's realistic too. Now, I mean, you can't hit 100% of your goals every single time. And, you know, even, and can, Connie, you know, you could have the same sort of thing. You know, what, what if, um, you know, Kate decides to branch out and try something and, you know, it doesn't work out. I mean, that's realistic. Not every business is 100% on the upgrade all the time. 
Yeah. Patrick, what, what is it that you love to do that doesn't make money? Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I, I uh, maybe Barbara says I, I, I'm not a very commercial bookseller. She's probably right. I mean, there's certain things that I, that I like. Um, it's just the kind of books I like to read sometimes aren't, uh, don't have a huge audience. Um, that's okay. I'm actually, fun. Well, yeah, I'm totally supportive of that. Oh, you as always, as always we have fun. some books that make money. We can have books that don't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've always been very supportive of that. And, um, but we know that the big blockbuster books sometimes will pay for us to do a lot of the cool stuff that we want to do. So it's striking that, you know, that balance. And, um, and we all, we all bring different, you know, different tastes to the mix. And I think that's important, you know, so that we can cover the broadest audience. It's very true. How many yeah. employees do you have, Barbara? I think we've, we probably are 20 or something like that at the moment, but um, some of them are part-time. Patrick is being modest. He's actually the soul of the bookstore. He's the only irreplaceable oh. employee that we have. So it's that's true. Awesome. Um, somebody has to have that, that same thing that Kate and Josie have, that real passion, that, that love for it. Um, and Patrick, of all of us, is the most invested in, in actually loving the books. And, and he's wonderful. While we've been doing all these Zooms, he has had some amazing conversations. He'll come in at the end of a fairly commercial conversation and off he'll go, you know, and the author <laughs> loves it. And I'm going, well, good, you know, yay, because either I didn't see those movies or I hadn't read that book or I don't know that band or- You do that you too know. though, Barbara. Hmm? We, all do, we all have fun with our digressions. We do. Yeah, we, we do. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of fun and, and, you know, but not every digression is successful. So nope. that's why I'm saying I would really love to see Josie fall in love with an idea and digress and then, and then have to figure out what to do when it doesn't work. The thing, the secret, Jane, is never to bet the whole farm. You have to do manage risk. You know, you can, if you can afford to lose X, then try it. And if it doesn't like wipe the whole business out, which is which is a, a wisdom that many people never learn. Yes. Well, Barbara just goes for it, you know, and we're, we, we kind of like, oh my God, this is gonna, and uh, she has that visionary instinct, uh, you know, to know what's, gonna, what's worth trying. Well, you know? not every time, but you know, I, and I, as I say to you, you know, my personal finances are not affected by my decisions, only yours. So I try to take really good <laughs> care of you, but you know, in a worst case, um, I, I, write, I, I write a check way. in a worst case, if it comes yeah. to that. Anyway, Connie, um, I'm so glad that you have published this third book. And I recommend to people who may not have come across the art of betrayal up until now, uh, or the series rather, that you go back and read the first two. You don't have to, to read this book. Um, it's a great standalone as it is, but I think it's fun to go back and read the first two, uh, which are now available in paperback as far as I can remember. Am I right? No, they're not. not. They're hardback and Kindle and, uh -huh. and audio. Um, I'll have to have words with your publisher, shame on them. Um, but it would be nice if they were in paperback, but yeah, anyway, if you don't want to buy the hardcover, read the version and then um, come to the art of betrayal because there's a really nice story arc that goes on here. And there's a lot to learn. And I, I really think that people, uh, one of the attractions of reading crime fiction is all the cool stuff you can learn um, in an area that you might not have any, any expertise. And I've learned enormous amount from Jane. And now I've learned from you um, at the same time, having the pleasure of reading a good story and really liking characters. And um, so I, I think people who read crime fiction are fascinated with the stuff we've been talking about, the business aspects, you know, the antiques. How I really think this idea of learning new things is a truism of traditional mystery readers. Yeah, no, I do too. 
I definitely do. So thank you for your time. Um, we do have autographed copies, as Patrick has mentioned, and we do have at least one left of Hidden Treasure. So we'll be seeing Jane in December around the 14th for what's yes. the title again? It's Jane Austen's, Jane Austen's Lost Letters. Oh, Jane oh. Austen's Lost Letters. Wow. And Connie, remind us again next June, it'll be what for you? It's called The Shadow of Memory. That's a great title. I really like that. Anyway, yeah. I'm very enthusiastic about both these series and highly recommend them to all of you. So thanks for joining us. Uh, there'll be a lot of guests you. available. Sorry? Forgot, you. forgot audience questions. Oh, I did. Well, Patrick, I'm going to sit back and let you do that. You're right. <laughs> I just moved right to the close. There aren't a whole bunch of them, but there are a few. So uh, we we'll still have a few minutes. All right. um, yeah, Paula Mounier, uh, your fellow author. Um, she writes, you both, uh, you both write such beautifully researched stories, but the research never slows your stories down. Uh, how do you do that? It's got to be a fine line, right? I'm going to let Jane take this one. Um, I do a lot of research. I love the research. I actually like research so much, you know, and so I had to make a rule. I only research until I have the answer that I went to get. Otherwise, I just keep on going. Um, and one of the things that I make a point of is translating the research into kind of the the day to day, the prosaic. It, it never, I don't try to layer on it. I don't try to sound pedantic. It is just part of what it is. Yeah. I. I feel the same way. I, I just could get lost in research and I have to really discipline myself not to do that. But um, I, part of the revision process for me is paring down. I, I know a lot of people have to add. I never have to add. I always have way too much. And one thing that Hank Philippi Ryan said one time that has really just transformed my revision process, someone asked her, um, how do you revise? And she said, I go back and I take away everything that isn't the book. And so I always have it in my mind. And so I always have more information about these antiques and the history than I need. And that's when I go back, when I understand what the book is about, I go back and I say, that is not the book. It might be interesting to me, but it's not the book. And so I take, I take a lot of that out and I, and I pare down. So in my first draft, I just kind of throw everything in, but it won't stay. See, that's kind of like the Michelangelo releasing the figure from the stone, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sure. uh, Amber makes a comment. She says, I loved Jane's masterclass at the novel writing conference in Pasadena. I hope she teaches a workshop at Poison Pen again sometime, sometime soon. We've been talking about um, getting that, that whole writer's workshop thing up and running again. Right, Barbara? I think we will. We have. We were actually talking about using it on uh, Zoom, which um, would allow a much wider range of, um, of people to sign up. And, um, and Jane, since she liked doing that, maybe we'll have a conversation about that. We're, we're thinking of hiring somebody to actually administer a, because we've expanded to uh, more, more space upstairs, um, to kind of run a, um, a workshop and maybe a discussion program. I can definitely help you with that, but I also would just like to throw out there, um, thank you, Amber, that's very nice. Go to my website, janecleland.com, go to the events page. I offer uh, free monthly webinars on craft topics. Uh, I started in April, 2020 with the pandemic because all of my in-person events got canceled and I miss spending time with writers. So um, I think you may find those of interest. That's a great, a great thing, Jane. Good for you. And you've also written at least one uh, nonfiction book two. about two. two. Okay. Yeah, she's written two. Gotcha. Yeah, mastering suspense, structure, and plot, and mastering plot twists. Both won the Agatha for best nonfiction. Oh. And, and and they are excellent. They are excellent. I I have both of those books, and I Jane is an amazing teacher. 
Thank you. Yes, she is. Um, I've been I've sat through a couple of her classes at the store, but we'll talk, Jane. That's a yes. that's a really good thing. Maybe we can work out a partnership or something. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. And I know a lot about the administration now too. So wonderful. All right, we'll have a conversation about it. So thank you, Amber, for an inspiring question. What next, Patrick? I think that's about it. People are just chiming in, saying how much they like your your uh, classes and things. Oh, that's um, so nice. Yeah, so that's yeah, about it. Of course, in my classes, I mentioned this conversation. I wanted them to meet Connie, and of course, know the wonderful bookstore Poison Pen in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I've gone every year for one of my books until this year because of the pandemic. It was actually a thing of mine. <laughs> because Barbara is so supportive. Patrick, you're so supportive. You guys are just. Oh, thank you. You know what, Patrick and I are just suckers for really good books. <laughs> but yeah. We are, um, and it, it's a joy to work with people, you know, who share our common interests, which I think both of you bring out in your, um, well, Connie has a little more work to do because it's just Ivor and Kate at the moment, but you certainly, Team Prescott, brings a whole lot of people together that love doing that. And Connie, I expect you will probably have to add people, um, you know, in time if you're going to make it a thriving business. Undoubtedly, there will have to be at least one other person because nobody can run a business by themselves 24 seven. It's just too hard. That's true. And I, I'm just gonna add in, one of my dreams was always to come out to Poison Pen. Oh, good. And I never had the chance to do that. So maybe sometime I will have that chance. I, excuse me. I would love it. Well, you could come with Jane in December if we could work it all out. We can just do this all over again. It'd be a lot of fun. It right. Would. So I already closed out the program, so I don't have anything else to say. Sorry, Patrick. I totally blew it. Um, but in any case, it's really been a pleasure to spend this time. This has been a delight. It's thank you. So, thank you so much. And good night, everybody. Enjoy. Yeah, good night. Thank, Thank you, Jane. Bye. Thank you, Barbara. Patrick. You bet. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Good night. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.